cookout. <laughs> and let's have a good time. Luke chapter number 11 is where we're going to spend our time today. Uh, continuing, amen, to appreciate that we are still in a season of Pentecost and that uh, Pentecost is a powerful and important opportunity for us to keep thinking about what does it mean for us to move as people of God, infused and filled uh, and dwelt, if you will, to use a good old King James Version, with the power of God's Spirit. And that God's Spirit uh, is that which wills in us to do God's will. It is that which pushes us. It is that which uh, qualifies us. It is your BA, your master's, your PhD, your, 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 what's the, your jurist, your, your JD. Is that a, is that a degree? Amen. It's all them degrees. Your MD. Amen. The, the, the Holy Spirit is that which qualifies you. It is that which helps you to know that you've got what it takes to do the will of God. And you have enough power. And it also reminds you and I that the power of God's spirit uh, can always increase in us if we cultivate it. Uh, just like, you know, you have muscles in your arms, your legs, your body uh, that are inherently present, whether you've asked for it or not. How I many you know your muscles have to be cultivated in order for them to have strength to carry a certain kind of load. When you see people in the gym and you see them lifting, you know, hundreds of pounds, it is not because they have more muscles than you. Amen. They didn't get an extra set of muscles. You know, they weren't born, well, oh, they got 10 muscles and I only got two. <laughs> so I say amen. Amen. That's not what it's about. It's that, that they spent some time cultivating that which has already been inside of them. How many of you know some of us got some things inside of us that we have to cultivate? Amen, amen. amen. You haven't, you, you, you know, uh, uh, you, you, some folk don't have more love than you. They just cultivate it. Some folk don't have more joy than you. They just cultivate it. It's just about cultivation. And the power of the spirit is that it gives you and I cultivation uh, practices, possibilities, that you, if we endure and engage at them, it allows us to be more of what God would have us to be. If you're like me, you know, I want to be more of what God wants me to be. I, I you know, I don't want to be someone who just settles, you know. <clears throat> God, I've been walking with you for you know, old decades, so I'm cool, God. I just, I think I'm just, I'll just coast into eternity. <laughs> Amen. We don't need no coasting saints up in here. Amen. We need all of us to appreciate that there are practices we ought to engage that will help expand our spiritual faithfulness and strengthen the Lord. <clears throat> and that's what this passage today is going to give us an opportunity to preach and teach from. It is a passage about the Lord's Prayer and what it means to persevere in prayer, what it means to make sure that as we have God's spirit, as we have God's favor, God's direction, these inherent gifts, these inherent uh, 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 muscles, if you will, that there are moments and times in our life that we need to cultivate practices that strengthen that which is already inside of us. And that when we pray, when we engage in the practice of prayer, it helps to expand our vision, our, our appetite, our understanding, our competency of God's will. And so prayer today, as we you know, work through this uh, month of anniversary, will be the topic of our time of preaching today. And so we'll start in Luke chapter number 11, verse number one. Now this is Jesus uh, is with his disciples. The great thing about Jesus is that Jesus always gave his disciples proximal spaces to learn from him. Jesus wasn't, you know, teaching them from afar. Jesus leaned in with them. And so here you find verse number one of Luke chapter number 11. It says, and Jesus was praying in a certain place. And after Jesus had finished, one of Jesus' disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. 
And Jesus said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us, and do not bring us to the time of trial. Jesus said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to that friend at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within inside the inside the, you know, home, the building, if you will. Do not bother me. The door has already been locked and my children are with me in bed. That's how many of us would react. Amen. Somebody showed up at your door at midnight, asked you for a midnight snack. You'd be like, no. <laughs> so they don't go down like that. We in the bed. Somebody say amen. Jesus give very practical, you know, parables and examples. Jesus want folks to understand what he's talking about. How I many know it sounds ridiculous for someone to show up in your house and don't none of y'all show up to my house? Amen. I'm not Jesus. You know, I'm just playing. I'll leave you some cookies on the, on the you give me a call before you come, I'll leave you some on the porch. No, uh, uh, I, I, uh, verse number eight, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Interesting, right? Like, you know, if you come knocking on my door and, you know, you won't leave. Because we friends, I'm not going to call the cops on you, right? Be like, all right. You may be mad. You may be kicking the door and the floor all the way to the front door. But you're going to give you something because you just want you to what? Go away. Go away. So I can't deal with this tonight. <laughs> I got to wake up for work. Got to go to school. Verse number nine. So I say to you, ask. Everybody say ask and it will be given you seek. Everybody say seek, and you will find knock. And everybody say knock, and the door will be open for you for everyone who asks receives. And everyone who searches or seeks finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. Verse number 11, is there anyone among you? If your child asks for a fish, you will give them a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will you give them a scorpion? Think about this. This is Jesus. He's making it plain. If you then, who are evil, she's got through a little dig there, mm -hmm, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? Woo, this is the word of God for us, the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk about the just simple topic, don't stop praying. Don't stop praying. God bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide your words in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And please send your anointing. That makes preaching and teaching easy. And we'll say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let all the people of the way say amen. Come on, just tell your neighbor, don't stop praying. Come on, tell somebody else, can't stop, won't stop, praying. Now, what is so powerful about this passage, particularly as it exists in all three of the Synoptic Gospels, is that Luke is always, as a writer, as an author, with an audience in mind, Luke is always trying to make sure that there is a consistent universality of application to his message, which means that Luke wants everyone to know that everyone is included in this declaration about whatever topic he's speaking about. That Matthew writes with a Jewish audience in mind. So Matthew, when he writes, he's always throwing in scriptures from the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, the prophets, and the Torah, uh, because uh, the, the, the Jewish readers will recognize that Jesus is actually fulfilling our cultural expectations of what a Messiah would be. But when Luke is writing to the Greeks and the non-Jewish folk, they don't have a context or a concern about 
Jesus being the Messiah. Jesus in the Lucan narrative or the audience Luke is writing to, Jesus is someone in the audience's mind, one of many gods that they have to figure out how to engage and interact with. As a matter of fact, it is, it is, it is believed that in the Roman Empire, in the early Greek culture, uh, they believed that all the gods were to be worshipped. They weren't just supposed to worship one God. And if you worship one God, you were considered a heathen, a pagan, someone to be persecuted. Why? Because the job of empire is to maintain control through violence for a false peace. So what you think about this, right? If I conquer you as a nation and you have your own gods, your own practices, then, you know, I want to make sure that as long as you've given me your taxes, you can kind of do whatever you want to do. And just in case God is real, I want to make sure you can keep worshiping your God because I don't want your God mad at me. Because, you know, Caesar in their mind was a God. And they all, I think, understood that, you know, emperors rise and fall. <laughs> so I don't want no problems with the gods that outlast our gods. And so there was this sense, right, that Jesus need not be described from a Jewish perspective to the Greeks about his historical significance. And yet we see that Luke is trying to make sure that Jesus is positioned in quite a way that the power and impact of Jesus' life is so persuasive that those individuals who hear about Jesus for the first time will be so convinced and curious about his life that they would want by their own decision to make a choice to live their life after the way of Jesus. And so Luke is writing with this universal lens. He is trying to make sure that everyone who reads about the life of Jesus is given enough information that they can make a decision on their own about what it means not only to follow Jesus, but to follow Jesus faithfully. And so in this way, Luke highlights the, uh, the Lord's Prayer as a formula not to be prescriptive, but to be descriptive. Because if you're a, a non-Jewish person, you don't have the book of Psalms to use as your prayer book. <laughs> Hello, somebody. What do you think about this, right? If you're Jewish in this time, you go to the temple and you, you hear the prayers all the time. But let's say you from, you know, one of these Greek uh, Roman towns that don't have the Old Testament or the Jewish scriptures. And now you're trying to figure out how should I pray? Well, Luke will give you a formula and say that when the disciples ask Jesus how to pray, Jesus says, pray like this. Repeat after me, all of us have said this before, but Jesus said we ought to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus taught them how to pray. But Jesus was not asking them to let that be the extent of their prayer. As a matter of fact, if it is indeed the case that Jesus gives not a prescription, meaning a, a, a template for you to verbatim only pray this way, Jesus is describing to you what it means to pray, then I think it's important for us to break down what this prayer is really attempting to offer to you and I when we seek to enter into consistent prayer and communication with God. Because at the end of the day, prayer is nothing but communication with God. Sometimes the best prayer you can pray is Jesus. 
Anybody ever been been riding down and some Jesus? And that, that, that's the most abbreviated but nuanced and full prayer you prayed in a while. Yeah. And I'm not talking about you who use Jesus' name in vain, like as a cuss word, you know. No, I'm not talking about using Jesus as a cuss word. I'm talking about you who are in a fix, in a situation, and you don't have much else to say, and all you can say is, Jesus. that's a prayer. Amen. But you ought to have a little bit more to your prayer from time to time. <laughs> Hello, somebody. And so Jesus offers this kind of a description of prayer. One of the first things I think in the passage it, it lifts up is your prayers ought to be intimate with God. Our Father. When Jesus says our Father, Jesus is not making an anthropomorphic description of the maleness of God. A lot of people feel like our Father means that God is a male. No. Jesus ain't trying to make a declaration about God's gender. Jesus is saying, when you pray, understand you're praying to someone who is supposed to be a good force, a parent, a caretaker in your life. And so your relationship with the God you pray to need not be one that is afar off. But it can be one where you can literally lean in and say, my father, my mother, my parent, my intimate one, the one who I know loves me and the one I love. I want you to think about it. Some of us ain't have real good love in our life, so we don't really appreciate the significance of being able to lean in with someone who you know loves you and you love them in return. Because you know that if you love me and I love you, I can literally talk to you about anything. Woo. And you're not going to throw me aside. Your prayers ought to be grounded in an intimacy, listen, with the creator of the universe. Not just some, you know, old white fella sitting on a throne in some clouds and you sitting there trying to figure out how can I go through all these hoops and leaps and bounds to work through all my preconceived notions. No, you ought to be able to lean in with intimacy from the get go and say, my God, my father, my mother, my parent, the one who gave birth to me, the source of all that is good and even struggles in my life. God, I am calling out to you. When was the last time you had an intimate prayer with God? The last time you leaned in with God and it was tears rolling down your face. It was uncontrollable laughter or it was a serious amount of questions. Somebody say, my prayers ought to be intimate. Uh, Jesus also says, then your prayers ought to invoke wonder and reverence. Huh. Hallowed be thy name. Hallowed. What does that mean? I'm on some holy ground. Your name is special. Why? Because you are special. Your prayers ought to, ought to always have space where you are understanding that intimacy need not be confused with the familiarity that breeds contempt. But you ought to always approach God with a sense of wonder. Sense of God. Lord, God, I, I know you big. You know, I got a few degrees, praise God. I've been around, I've traveled the world, praise God. I've read a lot of books. I've I got a few degrees from the School of Hard Knocks. But even with all the knowledge and the wisdom I've attained over my life, I realize, God, you are still bigger. Yeah. It's so fascinating to me in this time of anti-intellectualism where people eschew the guidance of those who have spent a lifetime mastering a discipline. That they think that they can be as smart as someone by watching a few YouTube videos. And it's true about almost any topic. COVID, monkeypox, politics, finance. Folk will watch a few YouTube videos and they'll think they're smarter than everybody else. Why? Because they've shrunk the world down to their own understanding. But when you pray, you ought to pray realizing, God, I am praying to someone who is bigger. The expanse of God's knowledge and wisdom and power. How many know it dwarfs yours? I know we don't like to hear that in the United States of America. <laughs> where we all think we the biggest, baddest thing out here. But how many of you know that God is bigger than the United States of America? 
God's bigger than you. God's bigger than me. God's bigger than us. So hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is that saying? That God has a plan. Your prayers always should always put at the forefront. God, what are you doing? in the world. What are you doing in me? I know I have my own plans. How many had your own plans? You know, by the age I was going to be 21, 25, 30, 40, you know, that this is going to be my plan. And I'm going to live my whole life on this plan. Hello, somebody. Inflexibilities of your plans. How many know sometimes your plan and God's plan ain't always the same plan? And so when you pray, you ought to pray and say, God, your kingdom, your kingdom, your plan. I want your plan in my life, God. I mean, I got my own sense of what I feel called to do, but God, I'm willing to put my plans in front of you, God, and let you have some say so. Now, if we're not praying a lot, how many know we're having a lot of activity without God's input? Oh, uh, there's one survey that says that the Christian in America prays about four minutes a day. How many know that's about, you know, you take your three meals, if you're lucky, and you pray for a minute, <laughs> all right, and then, you know, you wake up, God, I thank you for waking me up, amen. Go to sleep, now nah, lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep, thank you for everything you did, amen. How many know for some of us, that's the extent of our prayer life? You have not put anything before God as of today. So my question to us is, if the description of prayer is always also an acknowledgement of God's plans, then God, how can I make sure that what I'm doing today is in reflection of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven? And one of the great challenges of our moment, I believe, is that we got a lot of folks praying, but they're not centering the kingdom of God in heaven. How can you be uh, an agent of God's kingdom and you full of anti-blackness, anti-brown sentiments? You a homophobe, you a hater, you a violent person. You love to see folks suffer if they don't agree with you. Is that, is that heaven? Now, it was so fascinating when you ask people, you know, do you think heaven, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And they say it's going to be like, you know, our churches. <laughs> well, I don't want to go that heaven. <laughs> amen, amen. We, we do church pretty good here at the way. But if heaven was like the way, I'd still be a little hesitant. <laughs> Just here to tell you. Amen. We do good. Give your neighbor a high five and say, we got a good church. I'm not hating on the way. All you in virtual space, we're not hating on one another. But there are a lot of gaps in the human construction of civilization and relationships. And so our prayers are to always center God's heavenly ideal. Well, the imagination, the cultivating of a place where, as some of us say, we all can belong. We all can fit in. The cheers anthem, don't you want to go? where everybody knows your name. And you're always glad you came? That sounds like heaven to me. But how many know there ain't a whole lot of places you can go where everybody knows your name? Why? Because some of us, are, our brains ain't big enough to remember everybody's name. Your brain too small to remember. You don't even know your name half the time. You so filled with all kind of busyness, anxiety. Hello, somebody. So the question for us is, God, when I pray, can I center your kingdom in heaven? Which means that I can't be a racist and be in the will of God. I can't be someone committed to violence and be in the will of God. I can't be a manipulator and a schemer and, a, and, a, and, a, and an exploiter. And I believe sometimes our prayers lack the confession of how we show up in the world. And that's why we keep showing up that way. If prayer is communication with God, I got a couple more. Prayer must acknowledge your own humanity and that of those around you. Forgive us our debts, our trespasses, 
What is that saying? God, that means God, I know I, I'm, I'm, I, I, got, I, got some, I got some growing edges. Yeah. <laughs> I tried I try to do the right thing today, God, but I slipped. Yeah. I mean, you know, they, they, they put some grease on the ground. They put a banana peel in front of me. So guess what? Now I need to forgive them too. Your prayers are to acknowledge your humanity and the humanity or inhumanity of others. What does that do? It helps you be gentle with yourself and other people. When we don't pray a lot, then we get filled with resentment and hold grudges. And even when you do pray, you kind of still feel like, okay, God just put a bright red line between me and them. So I can get as close as I can. <laughs> Hello, somebody. How many know sometimes you got to have a bright red line on your job with some folk? It don't mean you mean them harm. You, ain't, you don't wish they be fired today. You don't, you don't wish that they, you know, go get hit by the bus on, on, the, on, on the lunch break. You're not praying for that. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Man, why? Because the, 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 the part of your prayer before was about the kingdom of God. Amen. You ain't praying for nobody's death and demise. But I am praying that some of these folk lose the power to have influence over our lives. You can exist, just exist over there. Bright red line. <laughs> Till you catch up with what it means to love other people well. But acknowledging that in your prayers helps you to not be too upset with people who are still behind in a certain part of their life or their approach or their worldview. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Your prayers, listen, are to acknowledge that there's evil in the world. Hello, somebody. That temptations are real. Don't be some of these folk out here that don't feel like you, eat. the devil's not real. No, the devil's real. You need to understand, evil's a real thing. And I'm not talking about, you know, the things that, you know, you just disagree with. I'm talking about a real force that is opposed to the good and the right in the world. Now, I believe in evil. I believe in the devil. But evil and the devil are no match for God. People say, you know, God's, uh, God's counter is, is the devil. No. The devil is like, you know, uh, just a follower gone awry. The devil don't have no more power than God. Evil does not have more power than good. That's why we're always told to overcome evil with good. So when we pray, prayer should help you to be clear about evil, but it should also help you to understand that good will always outlast evil. You being a good person. And I know it's hard. How many know it's hard? It be hard to be a good person in these streets, amen. Because you got some folk out here, they so full of the devil, amen. And you know they full of the devil. Like when you see them, you see the devil. You look in their eyes, you like, oh, ain't nothing but the devil. That be I got to get away from you. Cause if you keep I keep fooling with you, I can still got a little devil in me. Praise God. I'm trying to keep the devil under subjection. Uh-huh. Anybody ever like that? The devil, you know, the devil in me. I'm trying to decrease, take some air out that balloon in me. But you have a you have a way of pumping it up. <laughs> bright red line, bright red line. You ought to ask God this week. God put a bright red line between me and the devil. I don't want to be in company with the devil, cause I don't want to become a devil. Hello, somebody. Acknowledge evil, but don't be overcome by evil. Acknowledge injustice, but don't be overcome by injustice. Acknowledge the manipulators, but don't become a manipulator. Acknowledge the exploiters, but don't become an exploiter. Why? Because when you become the very thing that you're praying against, then that thing begins to win. And your prayers, your prayers are prayed differently when you are centering the evil in the world. So Jesus goes on to say, huh, those who ask will receive. Those who seek will find. And those who knock, the door will be open. The persistence 
of asking, seeking, and knocking is the key to you and I receiving strength, wisdom, and power as we pray. Now, if you're like me, you prayed a prayer and the prayer didn't happen. At least the answer you wanted didn't happen. Sometimes you confuse asking with answering. How many know my children ask me for things all the time? And they think, well, just because I ask, you ought to do it. Daddy, I want this. All right, well, that's a great ask. <laughs> I remember Nyla told me, all my friends, they're going to live in, in, in the Netherlands and Germany. And, and I want to go visit her for her birthday. I said, wow, that's quite an ask, Nyla. Why can't I go? I said, I mean, you can ask. <laughs> but, but I have a, bigger, a better perspective about what's going into your ask. I think God wants some of us just to get in a good rhythm of asking. Some of us don't ask because we don't believe the answer is even on the table. Some of us don't ask God for anything because you've been so disappointed. You've heard answers that you've just not been able, listen to the next point, to seek out for understanding. Asking is about your needs, but seeking is about understanding. Ask for what you need. Be bold about what you need. God, this is my need. I need this. God wants to cultivate courage in you to ask. God wants to cultivate hope in you to ask. The asking is not about the answer. It is about you and your ability to have enough courage and faith that I can ask God for anything. When the last time you asked God for something that was big? Not was like, God, I, I, I want a house. Well, you know, fix your credit. Save some money. Now maybe that is a big ask for some of us because you know, our credit, you know. <laughs> We started a little early, you know, with phones and things, and, and, and we, you know, we, we were victim to predatory. You know, I went to UC Davis in my 1993. I walk on the UC Davis campus, one with my parents, one with nobody. I was happy. I was proud to be on my own, and there was a Discover credit card booth. <laughs> Free credit. I said, come on, somebody. $2,500. Free credit card. I said, well, why would I turn down something that was free? <laughs> Praying on college kids on campuses. Took me 20 years to pay off what was free. I wish I could talk to you today. Some of us have been prayed upon so we don't ask for big things. But God is asking you, can you learn to pray and in your prayers, ask me for big things. Because it is just the courage to ask is one great uh, uh, st uh, 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 obstacle for you and I, a threshold for you and I to cross, asking. But even when you ask, the next threshold is that sometimes you have to learn to seek so you can find. What does that mean? The ask is the first threshold, but the second threshold is being able to seek out understanding. God, I asked you for this, and sometimes I got it, and sometimes I didn't. But the question is about the process of what it means to get an understanding. Seeking and searching requires more than an immediate or singular response. If you're seeking, for something that is a continuous, persistent process. I will not give up until I understand. We ought to keep praying because in our praying, we get to seek out wisdom and knowledge from the almighty God. And the great thing about prayer, the best prayers are not prayers prayed in isolation. So when I pray with a prayer partner, with a prayer group, when I sit in community and we are collectively seeking for understanding. How 
many of you know, uh, you get to learn a lot about how God moves when you see how God moves in other people. Amen. The process of seeking is about God won't answer or reveal it all at one time. Because time can some, in some cases, be the enemy of your prayer. If God says, not yet. I mean, no, God's not yet may seem short to God. Well, you know, God's not yet. God's in eternity. I'd be like, God, did you forget about me? I know you're in eternity, you know. You think it's a little blip on the screen, you know. Your, your little, you know, pause is my whole lifetime. <laughs> I'm tired of waiting on you, God. Can you do it today? But that's why Jesus in the passage, you, you got to keep knocking on that door persistence think about this Jesus uses a cold analogy now first I'm your friend I'm outside your house is late which means that my priorities of helping other people at midnight has gone drastically down my priority list I'll help you in the morning I can't wait till the morning well, I'm gonna keep asking I'm gonna keep asking and if you keep asking and it stays on the mind of the person you're asking sometimes they'll just give it to you so you leave them alone Leave me alone. My, my peace is worth more than what you're asking me for. You want some bread? It's all you want here. Take the bread. So I got to go to sleep, man. Don't you know that everything you're asking God for is not so, in, not so significant to God? God owns everything. God, you know, God, God has an abundance of everything. So anything you get from God would not leave God without abundance. It's all within God's power. Persistence is then about you and I creating a discipline of keep coming to God. God, even if your answer is no, I'm going to keep coming to you. Why? Because even underneath your no, there's a yes somewhere. Even underneath your no, not today, not yet. Uh, how about this? How many know God's alternative is often better than your first option? I prayed for this. God gave me that. You forgot about that. He's like, thank you, God. <laughs> Anybody ever got something from God and you know you prayed for something opposite and then when God gave you a different thing, you're like, I knew God. I prayed this from the beginning. <laughs> Can I talk to some honest people in here today? God, I, I know I was praying for that. You gave me this. This is what I really meant. I misspoke in my prayer. Be persistent. Because as Jesus said, if you who are evil would not give your child a snake when they ask for an egg, wouldn't give them a scorpion if they ask for a fish, if you who are evil will give good things to your kids when they ask you, would not God give you something Good, even when you're asking for the wrong thing. And I'm here to tell you, child of God, that prayer gives you and I the opportunity to get strength and faith in our life just by the process of engagement. And that's why I like the part where it says, and knock and the door will be open. If asking is about getting comfortable with your needs being laid before God, and seeking is about you learning how to trust the process of your prayer, then knocking is about you learning that it's going to take something from you at times. You can't knock on a door without some physical contact. You can't knock on the door without exerting some strength. Sometimes God is going to give you an answer and it's going to require you to do something. Do I have anybody in here today that acknowledges that some of my prayers, they only got an answer when I was willing to do something. When I was willing to do something different. Uh, I think it was Sojourner Truth or it was one of them uh, who said that I prayed many years but didn't get the answer to my prayer uh, until I put my feet on it. Uh, you ought to tell your neighbor, you ought to put your foot on a prayer. Uh, you ought to reach out and open a door uh, of opportunity opportunity that is connected to your prayer i'm here to tell you god wants you to be an individual a collective who can say i boldly ask you for anything and i'm willing to go through the process of understanding but god when the opportunity arrives i'm not going to 
to sit on my derriere. I'm not going to be paralyzed by the no's that I've heard in the past. But I'm going to knock on the door until that door starts to crack a little bit. When the opportunity presents itself, I'm going to learn that my knocking is a form of manifesting. I walk down some of your row. Uh, everybody talking about can you manifest it? Uh, can you speak it into existence? Uh, I'm here to tell you I serve a God uh, who likes to hear that you are about manifesting uh, because God said uh, I'm the one that put it in your mind uh, while you were praying. Uh, God said I put the seed in your mind uh, while you were seeking me out. Uh, you thought you thought it up on your own. But God said, no, no, no. While you was on your face, while you was in the Tuesday prayer meeting, while you was hanging out with your prayer partners, I taught you how to ask me for something that you knew nobody else could do. I, I taught you how to be persistent, to keep seeking until you were fine. I taught you not to throw in the towel. Just cause you couldn't get an answer fast enough. But one of these days, you got enough courage, you got enough imagination that you said, you know what? Today I'm gonna manifest it. I'm gonna speak it as though it is, even though it's not. And in the course of my manifesting, I'm gonna knock on the door. I'm gonna keep knocking. Till my knocking turns into a pounding. Till my pounding turns into a kicking. And God, when you open the door, I'm so glad nobody can shut it. Do I have a witness today that can say, God, open the door that no man, no woman, no system, no government, no sickness, no illness, no depression, no amount of money could close the door that God opened. Seek, ye shall find. Ask, you shall receive. Knock, 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 and the door will be opened. Shout hallelujah. me don't stop praying whatever you do don't stop I know the no's may feel more frequent than the yeses but sometimes the no is an indication that you're still learning how to pray according to God's will so I'm gonna keep praying I'm going to keep praying, God, because even when I hear no, it's giving me more courage, more toughness, more persistence. So I can know that when I pray, I'm praying according to your will. And sometimes the no is good for you. It may hurt. Oh, I've heard some no's in my life and it hurt me. What? I don't want to hear no no's. I can't take rejection. I'm a sensitive person. <laughs> Can you imagine if you're so sensitive and God gives you what you're asking for that is more harsh than you can even handle? Sometimes God's no is to save your life. Sometimes God's no is to protect you. Yeah. Daddy, I want to go to the Netherlands. No, you're not going over there. Why not, Daddy? Because I've been there before. <laughs> you won't do well over there by yourself. Oh, but they'll take care of me. No, they won't. No, they won't. As my dad used to tell me, don't nobody love you but me and your mama. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes the no is to protect you. So then her prayers change. Well, daddy, can we go do this? Yes. 
Come on, let's go. Martin Luther said it the best, underneath every no. Just like an onion, you peel back an onion. There's layers to this. Uh, tell your neighbor, there's layers to this. There's layers to your prayers. There's layers to God's answers. There's layers to what you will learn if you don't stop praying. 17 years, we're only here because we've not stopped praying. We're not here because of the preaching. We're not here because of the music. We're not here because we got a good. We're here because we've not stopped praying. And I want you to not stop praying. God, we are your people. We're the sheep of your pasture. And oh, what a gift and a privilege it is to carry to you everything in prayer. I pray, God, that you will bless us. I pray, God, that you will answer every one of our prayers. I pray that you will teach us. Hallelujah. I pray that you'll teach us, oh God, what it means to lean into our prayers with intimacy with you. You, God, are our loving caretaker. Some call you father, some call you mother, some call you creator. Some say God, some say Adonai. But God, you are the one who created heaven and the earth. You're the creator of the universe. And you invite us to address you with intimacy. You want us to be in deep, close, proximal relationship with you and your people. So God, we claim this privilege of prayer, God. And we're declaring we won't stop praying. Somebody say, I won't stop praying. God, teach us what it means to ask you for a big thing. I refuse to ask you for things that I could do by myself. But God, I need a big thing. I need a miracle. I need something supernatural. I need to have boldness and courage to ask you for big things. Knowing God that when I ask, it automatically launches me into a mode of seeking and searching. Knowing that it leads me to the activity of knocking and that everyone who asks, hallelujah, will receive and everyone who seeks will find and everyone who knocks, the door will be open. What a friend we have in G Jesus. Our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege! Hey, what a privilege to carry, to carry everything to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. Lift those hands to the Lord God. We want to give everything to you in prayer. God, we want to give you our greatest dreams, aspirations, our deepest hurts, frustrations, our disappointments. We want to give it to you and sit at your feet and be persistent, knowing that you are a good father, good mother, good parent, good creator, and you'll give to us good things. God, give us our good thing today. Draw these bright red lines, Lord God, so we don't have to be in too close proximity with the devils and the evils and the demons in our world. But surround us with the good things. In Jesus' name we pray. If you're here today and you need God to do something special for you, you need God to do something special in your life, just lift your hand right where you are. And I want you to practice some intimate moments with God. I want you to just believe that God can touch you right where you are. God can meet you right where you are. God can heal you right where you are. Because God says, I am in intimate relationship with you. God just said, I just need you to have the courage to ask me for it. I want you to have the faith that I can do it. 
I want you to have the hope that it will be done. And we'll say thank you, God, for all these things. Save, heal, deliver, and set us free. In Jesus' name we pray. Hug two or three people and tell them I won't stop praying. Tell them that I won't stop praying. Give them a high five. Give them a handshake. Give them a fist bump and elbow bump. And tell them I won't stop praying. Hey. Thank you.